Good morning, CCW. I did not expect this crowd today. Thank you guys so much for being here. Just look around. This place is a lot fuller than I thought it was going to be on New Year's Eve. It's an honor to get to preach for you all today. New Year's Eve is one of my favorite days of the year. Um, Maybe not for the reasons that it was when I was 20 or 21 years old. But New Year's Eve is still one of my favorite days of the year. And, but what I found is that New Year is going to come whether I'm awake for it or not. Now, I do the ball in New York. I can usually stay up for that. But I'm getting older. I go to bed a little earlier. And I've been working with the family to see if maybe in a couple of years we can celebrate New Year's Eve London style at 6 o'clock. And then have a nice dinner and go to bed. Now, we're not sold on that yet, and the Packers do play tonight at 720, so I will be up late this evening, and I do love New Year's. I'm a school guy. I I always like school. I love the beginning of a new term and the end of an old term. I like a fresh new notebook, a clean slate, sharp pencils, and new things to chase and explore, and New Year's Eve is kind of my fresh start as an adult where I get to go and chase something new. Next week, Pastor Rick is going to bring the vision. It's Vision Sunday. Does anybody remember the vision from 2023? I heard somebody say, burn the boats. Last January, the first Sunday, Pastor Rick said, burn the boats. He told a story about Cortez, I think is the name of the fellow. They went exploring. They burned all the boats. There was no turning back. I took that vision very seriously. What I did, I found a book called Burn the Boats. And I said, well, if my preacher's going to preach Burn the Boats, I'm going to read a book called Burn the Boats. And in that book, I found this quote that I want you just to hold on to that will come back in a little bit. The quote is, inaction costs you far more than failure. I'll say that again. Inaction costs you far more than failure. Before Vision Sunday, I kind of want to take a few minutes today and have Focus Sunday. Because what I believe about a vision is, no matter what the vision is, you won't see it if you're all out of focus. For example, I think Pastor Rick is going to give a vision, and it's going to be very clear. Something maybe like this. And you're going to see the vision clearly, and you're going to understand it, and you're going to leave church inspired, uplifted, and ready to go. But in about three days after next Sunday, boom, your world's going to explode. And you don't know where the vision is anymore. And the challenge just becomes in finding the vision. Can I remember what it looks like? Can I see it anymore? And if you're so focused in the thousands of things that are going to happen in your life that you can't even find the vision, you're not going to have a chance to fully explore and appreciate that vision and let the vision resonate with you and be meaningful in your life. So before we have Vision Sunday, I want to take a minute today and have Focus Sunday. And before we do, I want to pray. It's a little different. We don't have a turn in your Bible just yet. We'll get there. But I want to talk about some things, but I do want to make sure that I pray before we do that. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to stand here in your house and preach your word to your people. And God, I pray that no one hears my voice, but they hear a word from you today. My voice changes nothing, but your word can change everything, God. So I just ask that you will prepare us all for the word that you will send us. And let us just anticipate your voice today in Jesus' name. Focus means this, concentrating your interest on something or concentrating activity on something or giving a clear visual definition. You have to be in focus if you're going to see the vision. And for 2024, what I want to challenge everyone to focus on is the word of the Lord. Everything begins with the word of the Lord. Next week, Pastor Rick's going to preach about guys up on a mountain got a word from the Lord. The next week, he's going to talk about a man who got a word from the Lord. In the word of the Lord, the Bible, Genesis 1-3 starts with the word of the Lord. So the word of the Lord starts with the word of the Lord. God said, let there be light, and there was light. If you go all the way to Revelation chapter 22, the very end of the word of the Lord, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. The word of the Lord starts and ends with a word from the Lord. The interesting thing about the Bible is that in the Bible, 
It promises us that if we will focus on the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord will help us focus. Psalm 119, 105, that old vacation Bible school verse, says, Lord, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So when we focus on the word, the word provides light so that we can focus. Another verse not too far away, Psalm 119 and 130, says the entrance of your word gives light, Lord. It gives understanding to the simple. So as we stand here and sit here on the last day of 2023, before the vision comes, I want to challenge everyone to focus on the word of God. Keep it in the forefront. Now how you choose to focus on the word of God is up to you. But before we talk too much about that, I'd like to read you this. It says, David, WBS, if you know, you know. And as I open this up, I see David, hey, what you up to? Not much here, but thinking of one certain person, parentheses, hint, hint, parentheses, exclamation point. I'm really glad you wrote me back, exclamation point. But there was only one thing. It still didn't tell me whether or not. Now, I'm sure some of you may want to hear what the rest of that says. And believe me, I know. Because that document, along with several other papers exchanged in the winter of 1992, formed the basis of a passionate romance that involved several hugs and culminated with a hand-holding session Fingers interlocked one cold January night at Catherwood Baptist Church. And you better believe that I read every word of that letter and all the other letters. And you better believe that I explored, did she put a heart over the I in my name? How many exclamation points are there? Did she write love or did she write like? I took that letter and I read it and I read it and I read it and I digested the whole thing. If Amanda writes me a love letter and I don't read it, it's going to be bad. And if I write Amanda a love letter and she doesn't read it, it's probably going to be worse. We read the letters that people write us, especially when they're about love. It's just kind of rude and inconsiderate not to read a love letter. And you don't know the full story of the love if you don't read the whole letter. I was out with the family a couple of years ago. I know the day was June 24th. It's the night before Ella's birthday. We were having dinner and I said, Ella, what are you most looking forward to about your birthday tomorrow? And she tells me this. She says, the letter that you write me every year. Now at this point, there was no letter. (laughs) I think I had written her a letter the year before and maybe the year before that. But she was anticipating this letter. So the next morning, I got my pen out, and I wrote Ella a birthday letter. And I slid it under her door. And she took just a little bit longer coming out of her room that day. And when she came out, she was glowing just a little bit more than normal. Because Ella loves a letter from her father. Every once in a while, I'll write Luke a letter. A note, love letter, I guess. And he posts them up on his wall. For all the world to see, my children love a letter from their father. And I love that they do. And we have this book. And we stand up here and rightfully claim that this is God's love letter to us. Have you read the whole thing? Have you taken the time to digest each word and figure out why the comma is where it is? And what this word means and what that word means? Have you gone through it like it's a love letter from your father? So in 2024, my challenge to you on Focus Sunday is to focus on the whole word of God. I'm standing up here and telling you I want you to read the whole Bible this year. And there's someone right now saying, even Leviticus? And that old long psalm, and I don't even know like numbers, what does that even mean? Listen to me, inaction will cost you more than failure. 
It's well said that you overestimate what you can do in a week, but you underestimate what you can do in a year. So let's break it down. To read the whole Bible in a year, your number is 3.25. There are 1,189 chapters in this love letter that God has sent to us. And there are 365 days in a year. And when you divide that out, you get 3.25 chapters a day. But I've got really good news for you. Tomorrow starts leap year. You get a whole extra day to work on this challenge. (laughs) It brings your number down just a little bit. But it does bring it down. Somebody might be here saying, well, I'm only going to be doing it because of the challenge. And to that, I say, okay. Do it anyway. We can claim Isaiah 55, 10, and 11 right over that if you believe you're only going to do it for the challenge. And that says, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me, boy, but shall accomplish what I please and shall prosper in the thing that I sent it. Those are some of the blanks if you're filling in blanks. I don't know. I'm not really keeping up with that. But God's word will prosper in the thing that he sent it. Hebrews 4.12, the Bible tells us that the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God knows your intentions when you're reading the Bible, whatever they may be. And he still promises that his word is going to accomplish what he intends for it to accomplish. You guys know the name Lee Strobel, an atheist journalist, I think from Chicago, who set out to disprove Christianity, started by reading the Bible. Now he's a pastor in Texas. (laughs) Case for Christ, if you want to explore that a little bit more. It got real popular a few years ago. Another guy, Frank Morrison, he was an English lawyer and journalist in the early 1900s. The way I understand it, he set out to write an article to disprove the resurrection. And during his research, he became a believer. And so he wrote an article instead called, Who Moved the Stone? It's amazing what happens if you read the word of the Lord. For whatever reason it may be, read the love letter that God has sent to you. I got to stand here and tell you that I'm not the first one in my family to read the Bible. Amanda started doing it in 2012. Started at the beginning, sat there, thought she was crazy. I was like, what are you doing? She said, I'm reading the whole Bible. I said, even Leviticus. She said, absolutely. She picked up a copy of Radical by David Platt somewhere along the way. And yada, 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 11 years later, you've got a trial lawyer giving your New Year's Eve sermon. Now, I've since read the book. I started in 2022 with the goal to read the first five chapters of the Old Testament, the law, and the first four chapters of the New Testament, the Gospels. I said, if I can just get through these nine chapters, I will really have accomplished something. And along about March, when I finished up with that, I said, man, maybe I could read the whole Bible. And I did. I got about halfway through it by the end of 22, and I got most of the way through it by the summer of this year, and I read Revelation finishing just a couple of weeks ago. So I can tell you that I'm not preaching something I haven't done. It took me longer than a year, but I did. And thank you, Lord, that I did. I've read the whole letter that God sent me. What's going to happen if you take this challenge? You're going to start really strong, and you're probably going to blaze through Genesis, get through most of Exodus, and then you're going to get to the instructions for the temple. And you're going to miss a couple of days. And you're going to wake up one Saturday morning and you're going to say, man, 3.25 times 4. I need to read 13 chapters on animal sacrifice before my kid's baseball game this morning. (laughs) And my advice to you if you find yourself in that situation is simply don't. Don't try to overdo it. Just keep the course. Stick to the number. Move forward. Don't quit. Because if you have to read 10 chapters of Chronicles, no. No. Slow and steady. It took me two years with lots of breaks, and I work at a church. But I do want you to focus on the word of the Lord, 
the whole word of the Lord, I want you to read the love letter that God has written to you. Start today or tomorrow with a fresh slate and a brand new notebook. Things that helped me, you might keep a list. And every time you write, every time you finish a book, put the word in the list. And it became a joy to me to get to write that word in the list, to know that I was making progress. Another thing you might do, you might write out one thing every day that God tells you. Not a big, long thing, two or three lines. Keep a book, 366 messages from God in 2024. That sounds like the title of a real book. 366 messages from God in 2024. You know who's going to want to read that? Your kids. Maybe not right now, but if you pass away and they're digging through your stuff, they're going to say, wow, this is where mama read the Bible every day in 2024. This is all the things that God told dad when he read the Bible in 2024. Man, challenge you to do it. You might need to take a calendar and write a big cross every day that you read the Bible. Some of the kids from youth group send out these little pictures of a Bible. It's called one of an emoji. And so they'll send that and then with a question mark. And then they have to respond with a check mark or something. I don't know how they do. It's accountability partners. It may sound a little bit juvenile, but you know what? It took me 45 years to do this. So maybe juvenile is just what I need. Point one that we are finished with is focus in 2024 on the word of the Lord, the love letter God has sent to us. And while you're focused on that, I want to challenge you to ask God to show you a verse. This isn't in your notes. I should have put it there, but I forgot. Sorry. Ask God to show you a verse. A couple years ago, I stumbled across 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11. It says, aspire to lead a quiet life, mind your own business, work with your hands. I said, that's going to be my verse for the year. I'm going to lead a quiet life. First thing I did was tap out of social media for the month of January. And then I found some work to do with my hands, renovating a house. But then I was sitting in the office one day, and I had my phone, and the group chat started going off. Ding, 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 ding. And I said, this ain't a quiet life. So I silenced it, and I didn't hear the dinging anymore. I heard buzz, buzz, buzz. So I moved the phone across the room, and it still buzzed over there. And I said, I got to fix this. So I went and got it, and it took just about an hour, but I figured out how to turn notifications off on my phone. And I don't get any notification of a text, call, or email anymore. I don't get little bubbles on the messages. I have to actually go in there and see about it. Now, I keep and check up with that stuff, but it's made my life a whole lot quieter. It slowed me down just a little bit. And it's, you know, been interesting for Amanda. She knows that if she wants to get a hold of me, she has to figure out who I'm with and call them. <laughs> Last year, one year ago today, in my journal for 2023, I think I was thinking about burning the boats. And I was thinking about the light that that may cause. And I said in my journal, let your light so shine before men they may see your good works. And glorify your Father in heaven. Interestingly, I got to say that on this stage last week. My verse for the year as we lit the candles. It was the last thing I said. I didn't really have any particular acts that I was going to undertake in that. But I just wanted to work hard and let people see the Lord. We're not going to take a vote on how I did. But that was my thought for the year. In 2024, and this message is mostly for Dave Roper, I challenge you to find your own verse, and I challenge you to focus in on the Word. And while you're focused in on the Word, point two, I want you to ask God to show you His will in His Word. The will of the Lord. If you focus on reading the Word of the Lord, be on the lookout for God's will. I'm going to tell you, you can know the will of the Lord. I think there are a lot of people in the world who are looking for God's will. There are a lot of people who say, God, if you'll just give me a word, if you'll just show me what your will is, Lord, I promise I'll do it. If you're looking for the will of the Lord or the word of the Lord, I got to tell you, you're going to hear it today because we have the word of the Lord. And in that word, God tells us his will. It's just like the love letter. You got to read it. 
If I take the time to write you an instruction manual, to give you directions on how to do things, and you come to me and say, Dave, could I get a word on what you want me to do here? Just tell me your will. I'm going to be really interested in whether or not you read the book. God's will is in his word, and you can know the will of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, and you can turn to Ephesians. We're going to be there for a minute, and then we're going to go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17, the Bible tells us this. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It makes zero sense for God to tell us to understand what his will is if we can't figure it out. And he tells us clearly, understand what the will of the Lord is. And then you get into the really good stuff in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18, the very next verse. Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in fear of the Lord. Let me get this right. Don't be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. Speak to people in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Make melody in my heart. Give thanks in everything and submit to other people. Lord, could maybe I get another will? Because submitting to some of these folks, that's just not going to happen. And I don't really even sing. And I don't know that many psalms to tell anybody. And God says, okay, Dave, you need something a little more clear? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. And the end of these verses unarguably says this is the will of the Lord in Christ Jesus for you. If you want to know what the will of the Lord is, you're going to leave here knowing. The first thing is rejoice always. Then you can fill in your notes, pray without ceasing. And finally, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of the Lord in Christ Jesus for you. I've started my journal for 24, and this is the first verse on the first line of everything. So when I open it, I'm going to see that. I'm committed to trying to do the will of the Lord that I know in this coming year. And let me tell you, I'm not all that excited about it. Just being honest. It's not going to be easy. Rejoice. That word means to be extraordinarily happy, to feel and show great joy, like Buddy the Elf. He always rejoices, and it's kind of absurd. Some people want to hit him. Can you imagine me as Buddy the Elf? Can you imagine if we had a bunch of Buddy the Elves running around? Seriously, I'm just kind of even keel. I was telling some guys about this a few weeks ago. I just, I don't get real high, I don't get real low. I'm just kind of level. If a bad thing happens, it's going to get better. If a good thing happens, it's going to get worse. I just kind of go with it and always rejoice. Like it, it happens with me to be extraordinarily happy, so rare that I can remember. <laughs> like last Sunday here, man alive, I rejoiced. That was something to see, man. Thank you to everybody who had a part of that. Before that, December the 3rd, about 10.30, when the Packers beat the Chiefs. And before that, extraordinarily happy. I've told Rick this. I've confessed it. I don't know. Like, I feel it, but I don't show it. It's just not who I am. I keep my head down and go along. And that's when things are good. But to rejoice in the bad times? My car broke down. Praise the Lord. Got to go to the ER. Thank you, Jesus. I mean... It's, it's hard. I know this. If I'm going to rejoice, I'm going to have to smile more because I don't smile a whole lot. But inaction will cost you far more than failure. 
And I've practiced smiling with my family. Sometimes in the morning. And they, they beg me to quit. They tell me that I'm real creepy. So I just don't know about all this rejoicing. But God says in his word that this is his will. So in a room full of accountability partners, in 2024, I'm going to try to rejoice always. Two little words. That's the will of the Lord. But oh, there's more. The next clause in this is pray without ceasing. Keep in mind, first we're told to rejoice always. And now pray without ceasing. So if I put those together, it tells me I need to rejoice while I'm praying without ceasing. Sound daunting? I get it. The first step that we'll break this down into, if you are going to pray without ceasing, you're going to have to pray sometimes. Step one to pray without ceasing is pray. Because what I understand about not ceasing something is that if you never start... You can't not cease. You just live in a state of ceasedness. So the first step of praying without ceasing is to pray sometimes. And if we are to rejoice while we're praying, if you're like me, I'm going to have to tell God how great of a God he is and how much he loves us. And I'm going to have to thank God for sending Jesus to be on this earth for us and to pay the sacrifice for my sin that I couldn't pay. And I'm going to have to tell God how almighty and all-powerful and all-knowing and how pure and holy and how great he is. And I'm going to have to tell him all that before I ask him to cure the cancer. And I'm going to have to tell him how great he is before I ask him to be with the family who lost a loved one. Because if I just jump in asking God to fix all the problems that I see in this world, I won't be able to rejoice while I'm praying. There's a place in prayer to ask God to supply our needs and heal our sick, mend our wounds. The problem I think that I run into is that I don't hardly ever make a place for anything else. And that makes it really hard to rejoice while I'm praying. So pray sometimes. Pray joyful prayers. And finally, to pray without ceasing, I think we're going to have to develop a new mentality about praying. Because you can only talk so much. Granted, there are some of us who talk a lot longer than others. But at some point, you just can't talk anymore. And I think if we're really going to pray without ceasing... We have to develop a mindset that I'm about to shut up and pray. That's a little bit of a different thought. But prayer is a conversation between me and God. Me and God the creator who made everything, including me, who knows everything and through whom everything consists and everything is held together. The all-powerful, almighty God who does as he pleases. For centuries, men had to travel hundreds of miles sometimes with an unblemished sacrifice to a temple, to go to see a priest, to gain access to the throne of God. But now through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, through prayer, we have access to the infinite wisdom and knowledge and power and love and goodness of God. And when we pray, in those brief few moments, we never shut up. I don't do look at your neighbors, but if I did, we may have one, and I would tell you to look at your neighbor and tell them to shut up and pray. This year, I'm going to try to shut up and pray. I'm going to try to listen a bunch to what God's telling me. And when I do pray, I'm going to try to pray rejoiceful, that's not a word, rejoicing prayers. I'm going to try to say things about God's love and grace and give gratitude and thank God for everything that he is and all that he's done. I'll ask for supplication and needs too. But I'm going to try hard to thank God and listen to what he has to tell me. And speaking of thanking God, that's next on the list. In everything, give thanks. Thank you, Lord, for my bunion and bone spur. Because I have a foot, 
There's people who are missing a foot who would love to have a foot to have a bunion and a bone spur on it. And to give thanks in everything, we got to start thinking like this. A spirit of thankfulness. It may not be your foot. You might have a problem with your leg. Pastor Rick, earlier this month, walking around here on a cane. Some leg injury from his Thanksgiving tackle football game. He said it might have been from the yard pulling flowers or something, but I don't know. I think it was the tackle football. I think he's better, but you know what? I bet he was glad he had a leg that could hurt. We had a girl this summer in the hospital, and I didn't understand all the words that she was telling us, but she's here today, and she had a scare about her leg. And I went and prayed with her in August, and you know what we prayed for? She said, I want to keep my leg. I like my leg. It's a good leg. I haven't ever thought about having a good leg. I think about my bad leg, and even that's a good leg, and I'm really glad that I have it. But we pray for this lady's leg, and God let her keep her leg. And you know what she did? I'm telling you, two weeks later, she used that leg to walk out in 100-degree temperatures in August and coach little kids in soccer and tell them about Jesus. That's how she showed her thankfulness for God keeping her leg. Thank you. Like rejoicing, if we're going to give thanks in everything, we have to start with the good things. Is it easy for you to miss the good things? Sure is for me. And it all boils down to what I expect. If I expect something to happen and that thing happens, I don't even notice much less say thank you. But if I expect something to happen and it doesn't happen, I got something to say right quick about that. Let me give you an example. Amanda and the kids could sweep the floor, mop the floor, dust the house, get everything nice and clean, get a drink of water and leave their cups on the kitchen counter. I come in, what's the first thing I see? The cups. Even though I leave one there every day, I'm very hard to live with. I look past the good and say nothing. A lot of times I only see the bad. It's called being negative. And negativity makes war with thankfulness. There's good news though. I believe, I believe that if I stop taking everything for granted and I focus on the blessings that God has given me, and I give him thanks out loud for specific things that I can very easily become overwhelmed with all that the Lord has given me. To be thankful, just look around. Let me give it a try. God, I'm healthy And I thank you that I'm healthy enough to be on this stage here today. It's well said that a healthy person can have a thousand wishes, dreams, and desires. But a sick person only has one. Thank you, Lord, for my health. God, I thank you that I'm counted worthy to be here today. I thank God through Christ Jesus who counted me worthy putting me in the ministry There's people all over West Jefferson County that are still laughing about that. Y'all too. I have a little bit of imposter syndrome. I I just don't feel like I belong. Like I'm not a good enough guy to be doing this pastoring stuff. But I'm going to go with it and Lord work it out. So thank you for putting me in the ministry. The temperature in here, it's pretty good. And if you get too cold or too hot, somebody can come and adjust it for you. We're not outside in the rain or the cold or the heat. There's all kind of lights. I don't know how any of that stuff works. There's some kind of machine around here that blows smoke. I don't know how that works either. I got a microphone on my face. I don't have to yell at you. Somebody hooked this up for me, and it's connected to a speaker, and I have no idea how any of that works. Thank you, Lord, for people who do that. And if it goes out, somebody's going to run me another one. Thank you, Lord, that somebody's there to do that. We have a band that played. I didn't schedule them. I couldn't put them in key or tune or harmony or whatever it is that they need to be that we enjoy. I sat in a chair before I came up here that I didn't set up, 
and there's a table full of bread in the back that I didn't buy. Somebody gave it to us, and I didn't even go get it. Somebody else did and brought it here, and you can take some home with you if you want. Man, thank you, Lord. I got a wife that tolerates me. (laughs) Even when I don't say thanks and only point out the deficiencies. And these couple of kids, like the biggest problem we have is that we're worried one of them might have a nervous breakdown trying to be too perfect. One, One of them. I can't even get it how good they are. They won't get in any mischief with me. They act nothing like I did when I was their age. Thank you, Lord. I got a laid back boss who supports and encourages me, lets me do about whatever I want. I get to wear tennis shoes, shorts, and hoodies most time to work, even some Sundays if I'm not preaching. He puts up with me too. I'm not easy to work with. Thank you, Lord. I had breakfast with a friend just before Christmas. He's approaching retirement. And I got to thinking about it and I told him, I said, you know, if I retired, I'd probably do the same thing that I do now most days. And I sent him a picture of all my stuff that I was cutting out from Waldo. This place is full of kids. One day I counted six babies under one year old here. You know how many churches don't even have two? And the kids aren't in here, they're over there in the children's building being ministered to, loved, and cared for under the direction of a dynamic, young, energetic children's pastor who just got ordained. One day we had 95 kids and volunteers over there. The average Southern Baptist church attendance on a Sunday is 75 to 80. We've got more than that in the children's building. That's a ton of responsibility you've given us, Lord. And thank you. You know, after church, I don't have to walk home, and I didn't walk here. A lot of people do. All over the world, walk to church. Miles at a time sometimes. We have two cars in the parking lot. And it's a little cold outside so we can turn the heat on in those. When I get home, temperature controlled there too. I don't even have to sit in front of the air conditioner or stand over the furnace. Do you remember the furnace? Right in the middle of the hall. Third degree burn on my two year old foot. Air just blows out of the vents at the house. We got artificial lights. A TV or six for four people. Computers, even a few dusty old books sitting around. My pantry's full and I can't shove anything else in the fridge. But we really don't have nothing to eat. We're probably going to go out for dinner. Later on today I can watch the big game. Or I could start reading Genesis. Or I've got friends I could probably call or go see a movie. And when it gets to be time for bed tonight, I'm going to go to sleep in a big comfortable bed. And we're going to turn the heat down and the ceiling fan on so we can get under three or four layers of cover and still be comfortable. You know what? If it all falls to pieces tomorrow, I've had a whole lot more than I deserve. I'm so blessed. And I never even think about it. What if, just what if, everything that we didn't thank God for today was gone when we woke up in the morning. That would make it a whole lot easier to pray without ceasing. That would make it a whole lot easier to give thanks in everything. I know this, if I'm gonna give thanks in everything, I'm gonna have to start with the good things. And I'm gonna have to name my blessings out loud so that I can develop a thanksgiving muscle. So when the burdens come, I can be strong enough to give thanks for those too. And I can respond with gratitude. So we have this cycle that I see in 1 Thessalonians. And it starts with, in everything, give thanks. Because thanksgiving is prayer. And if you're praying prayers of thanksgiving, your heart's going to rejoice. And when you rejoice, you're going to find things to be thankful for. And when you tell God, thank you, you're praying. And we just keep going around in a circle of gratitude and that's something that I'm just not good at but I'm going to try to get better so for my focus in 2024 I'm going to focus on the word of the Lord and doing the will of the Lord that I know and that's going to be rejoicing always trying to pray without ceasing 
giving thanks in everything. Will you make the word of the Lord big in your 2024? Will you make the will of the Lord big in 2024? Because I know this, the world's going to come at you fast. And when the world comes at you fast, there's going to be a thousand things to focus on. But if you say today the word of the Lord and the will of the Lord is going to be big, when the world goes boom, we're going to see a picture, I think. And maybe we won't. Oh, it's going to be a lot easier to keep the vision in focus and to see it so much clearer. Will you let God be that big a part of your thousand things this coming year? It starts with his word and doing his will.